of connecting back to the root. So it was amazing. Yeah. We had to go for a walk. <laughs> I would love to do that. And wow. And if there's anything when we get started here that you would like to share with the group, I, I don't want to divulge your private privacy, but if there's anything, um, I would love to, would love to hear it. <laughs> okay. Um, let me just see here if Yvonne is able to join us and uh, Dr. Shabazz checking here um okay so i know everyone in the attendees the and so it's not we don't have any members in the attendees we do have a quorum though so we can go ahead i noticed i think that pamela started recording the meeting um or jennifer did somebody did <laughs> jennifer was that you yes okay all right, great. So I'll go ahead and uh, get us called to order. So I am calling to order the August 14th meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly at 2.04 p.m. With the extension of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, this meeting is being recorded and I am going to do a sound check. I see that Yvonne is uh, working on logging in. So if we could keep an eye out for her, that would be great. And, and also I believe that Dr. Shabazz will be joining us. Um, so let's see, let me start with you, Dr. Rhodes. Can you hear us and can we hear, I can hear you? you? I can hear and I can see everyone. Excellent, okay. And Hala. Yes, thank Excellent. you. Awesome, um, and Ms. Bridges. I can uh, see you. I mean, I can see you. I know you can't see me, but you also were frozen a couple of times in the last 30 seconds. Oh, no. Okay. Um, let me just check. It looks like my... That could be mine, but... Okay. Let's keep an eye on that. Yeah. Okay. Let me know if it continues. Um, all right. Great. And Jennifer and Pamela, can you hear us? And can we hear you? Yes. Yes. Great. All right. So I'm going to start off our meeting today with our first period of public comment. We have two periods of public comment at every meeting. Um, if you would like to make public comment, please use the, the raise hand function. I will read the public comment statement once. Uh, during the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your name, pronouns, and address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. And uh, while we will not engage in a dialogue, we will certainly be listening closely. So please go ahead and if you'd like to make public comment during this public comment period, use the raise hand function. And uh, otherwise, there will be a second period um, soon uh, later in the meeting um sorry i just got distracted because i saw that a second so um if you would like to make a public comment and you're coming in by phone you can use um the pound i think it's nine is is that correct jennifer it's star star nine thank you so please um use the star nine um to raise your hand if you're coming in by Welcome, Yvonne. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, excellent. And we can hear you. And we just started with our first, I just called our first period of public comment. Thank you. All right, so I'm not seeing any. Um, so I'm going to move on then. And um, today uh, we have... Uh, several items that I would like to get through. And just to clarify for anybody who's listening in the audience, we have moved the publication date into September. I'm working with the council president. Um, we'll either be presenting our recommendations at the September 11th or September 18th 
meeting of the council, um, which means that our report will be published about three days prior to whichever date we choose. So we'll um, we'll stay we'll stay on top of that, and I'll I'll keep folks posted on that. Um, so what I'd like to do today is most importantly, a draft of the report was sent to the assembly per our discussion last week. And I would like to take any feedback that assembly members might have available now. Um, if feedback is not available now, that's fine too. It can be sent to myself and Pamela and Jennifer, and we'll uh, make sure to um, have that incorporated so that it can be reviewed at the next meeting. Additionally, there are three of the recommendations that I would like to make sure we hit on today. Um, the first is the fund, and Dr. Rhodes and I will be speaking with the assembly regarding the fund. Um, and then also uh, there are two other, one um, that I'd like to flesh out a little bit further with the group regarding any recommendation we might want to make on cash payments. Um, or any discussion that we would like to see in the report regarding cash payments. Um, and then uh, there is a, a, another recommendation that I personally would like to present, um, and this may not be something that we get through today, we may have to uh, have a holdover to the next meeting, and that involves um, the uh, well, I'll I'll get to that when when I when I'm ready to when we get through the rest of these things. So, Dr. Rhodes, do you want to? Um, well, actually, let's let's go through and 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 discuss feedback from the draft. Um, so, the floor is open at this time. If folks have any feedback that they would like to provide at this time on the draft report, and don't worry about. It, it's all we're transcribing all of the meetings, so um, you know we'll catch everything. So if if you'd like to provide any feedback, please um, raise your hand. Did everyone get a chance to take a look at it, or are folks still um, going through it? Hala, I see I see both Hala and Yvonne. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to actually look at anything. Okay, um, no worries. And I might, I, it, something has just come up and I might have to leave pretty soon. So I'm just telling you like, um, yeah. my husband just tested positive for COVID. So, and I'm at work. So I don't, I haven't tested, but you know, I don't want to expose my coworkers to. Of course, of course. COVID. Yeah. So I'm going to put on my mask right now. But, <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'll let you know. <laughs> Yeah, do whatever you need to, Yvonne. Absolutely. I might have to leave in a little bit. Okay. I and was we, hoping to do this from home, and I ended up here at work longer than usual. So, no worries. Okay. Well, we can follow up by phone too. So, please do whatever you need to. Um, all right. And Hala, I did see that you were also about to say something. Um, similar. I haven't gotten a chance to get through this newest draft, but uh, I will. Thank okay. you. Okay. Excellent. All right. So again, you can call, you can call me, you can email. If you do email, just please only email me and, and Pamela and Jennifer. Um, and also next week we can um, follow up on, on that as well. And Pamela, I'm just remembering that we have um, something also that I'm hoping you'll be able to talk about today um, regarding a, a private um, fund, I think. So we'll do that as well today. Um, all right, so I don't see any other hands in terms of feedback for the report at this moment. So what I'd like to do, Dr. Rhodes, um, is to hand it over to you uh, to just uh, talk to the assembly about our discussion with Sean, where we're at with the two possible or maybe more than two options um, regarding our recommendation on the fund. Are you willing to, or would you like me? I don't want to put you on the spot, but. No, I mean, in summary, uh, there are two uh, proposals uh, that we have been discussing uh, here and then uh, with myself and Michelle going back and forth. Uh, the, the first proposal is that, uh, in terms of the fund, is that we uh, uh, accelerate 
the funding of the fund uh, by asking the uh, town council to over the next, I think it was it was four years over four years over the next four years, uh, appropriate enough money to bring us to the two million dollar mark by the end of year four, rather than uh, at the end of ten years, which would be uh, just um, too many years. So that was one of them. The other one uh, is to say to the town council. Uh, which was uh, also originally presented by uh, Michelle, that uh, the uh, AHRA borrow from the reserve funds, the balance of the money needed to get the $2 million now, and then pay back that uh, over the next years via the money that would ordinarily have been coming through us uh, through the stabilization fund, and also from other sources, uh, inc including free cash, et cetera. And I, I think that's about it. Uh, and those are the, are, are the two that are there. And Michelle and I have discussed in depth both of those. And uh, we certainly would like to have feedback on that from everyone uh, present on this call right now. Uh, and we are going to be meeting, uh, Michelle has set up this meeting with uh, Paul, uh, I believe Andy uh, and um, and the town council uh, president Lynn uh, to uh, and and possibly Sean. I'm not sure uh, to go over these two things so that we can come up with a final recommendation. Is that about it, Michelle? Yeah, that was great. I think I would just add as a reminder that um, this is going to be used as an endowment fund. So it's the investment income only that will be used on an annual basis toward initiatives. Um, we've already adopted sort of a philosophy that um, we will be looking to maximize our monies by partnering with other committees um, and other departments that are doing similar work to what we have recommended, um, where there's overlap and where Black residents can um, be benefited. So I think that's an important, so my thinking when we talked about this at the last minute, at the last meeting was, um, sort of, can we just we move the money into from one bucket of reserves to another bucket of reserves, essentially that has the name reparations on it, um, and and then uh, get us to the place where we need to be to make meaningful, um, you know, initiatives occur on an annual basis, starting sooner than ten years, as Irv said. Um, so I think that in an ideal world, um, I think that's a very, very strong way to approach this. And as Herb said, uh, we plan to have a discussion with some folks uh, next Monday. Um, hope, and it will, I believe, be before our meeting so that we'll be able to report back. But we're open to any feedback that you all might have um, at this time regarding those options. And, you know, it, it's important, I think, for us to think about what do we want and what would most benefit um, supporting the reparative justice plan that we're putting forward. And from a sort of political standpoint, um, where do we need to be to have uh, the, the, the folks who need to approve this uh, be supportive and embrace what we're doing? So I think that the option that at least I know Irv and I prefer will take um, absolutely uh, some work to make our case as to why that that option is is the preferred and 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 I think better option for for us. You know, one of the reasons for the option that I prefer, which is to have that uh, have the HR borrow that money and then pay it back through other means, is that we have the money now. It uh, makes concrete the uh, council's uh, pledge uh, for, uh, for the money. Uh, and it, uh, it relieves us of some anxiety in relationship to whether the council will continue to fund that 
in the years uh, going in, in the forthcoming years. Uh, the reason I am skeptical about uh, allowing that to occur is that there are two things. One, uh, if we allow that to happen, then we're, we're talking about uh, two election cycles and four budget cycles. And, and that to me puts that at risk uh, of, of a future council uh, and, a, and a future budget process. I'd rather have that commitment now up front uh, and concretize uh, where we have that money now rather than sooner than later. And, and it's done. And we don't have to uh, concern ourselves or have to be anxious about whether future councils will carry through on it because they would have already been done and bought into it. And just to add to that, I mean, I want to be fair and point out that in speaking with Sean, he, he really, I think he liked the concept, but had concerns about, um, you know, the possible precedent that it may set or a precedent that's already been set that now this continues with. Um, and so in, in borrowing from reserves. Um, so one one thing, though, to keep in mind that is critical is the town council, regardless of whether the money is in the reserves that it's in now or whether it's in a reparation stabilization fund, has ultimate control over the funds. So if the money were moved into the reparations bucket so that we could have the maximum amount of investment income to be used for initiatives, and there was some emergency that required the principal that is in that reserve account to be used, uh, there's still full control. The town council still fully has control over that. So um, the risk isn't very high. Um, it's more, I think, about the concerns of precedent setting, or as uh, Dr. Rhodes and I talked through it, more concerns about institutional memory, um, which I think was one of Sean's concerns. Um, so it's it's sort of, a, it's, 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 you know, it, it, your feedback is certainly welcomed and appreciated. And I think when we're able to um, flesh it out a little bit more with some folks involved in finance, it might be then, um, of course, we will bring it back to the group next week. So go ahead, Dr. Rhodes, I'm sorry. No, the precedent that I think uh, you're referring to is that the council uh, has already borrowed from the reserve fund uh, already. And uh, Sean uh, wasn't opposed to it, but uh, what he was opposed to, why he was opposed to it was more in principle in that uh, the council has short memory of what they do. And his fear is that uh, the money never will be paid back uh, and that the uh, reserve fund therefore would be depleted by that amount uh, added to the other amount that has already been borrowed by the council. Again, it was his, his concern was the short memory of the council and the uh, commitment of the council to pay that back to the reserve fund uh, that uh, at some point will be needed. Now, it, you can argue on both sides of it, but it seems to me uh, that if the council has already established that precedent and has said that they will pay that back, that is a promise that they have made. We are making the same promise uh, and having the council does have the ultimate control to pay that money back. Uh, and as Michelle said, well, if there's some really physical emergency, they may uh, say, well, we, we need this money. But then on the other hand, if they say that to us, then it would have to say it to the council in terms of what they've already borrowed. Thanks, Dr. Rhodes. Um, so would any committee members like to provide feedback right now on this? Okay. Um, so again, um, please, if you, you know, if you, if, if you have, as you processing this, any feedback you'd like to provide, just reach out to, to me and I'll make sure that that is incorporated into the discussion that Dr. Rhodes and I will have. And hey, I one, one thing is that I really would like to 
know if there are any uh, opinions or thoughts that uh, Pamela or Jennifer may have on this subject. I, I have to switch over to my phone because I'm going to head to my car. So um, I'll we'll be able to out. listen. Yeah. OK. OK. No All worries. Right. Sure. Thank you, Yvonne. Yeah. Bye. OK, Pamela. So I was actually going to suggest that we um, have the conversation about the other issue now because the two are sort of related, if that's OK with you. That's and um, and I do I have just one slide I'm going to try to share screen. I put together just one PowerPoint slide. So the um, the conversation that Michelle and I had uh, relates to what type of entity would hold the funds of the African Heritage Reparations after um, you've finished your term or for the you know, subsequent um, entity. And uh, this conversation really arose because I've started looking into ways in which the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion might either create a friends group to support the work that we're doing and the work of the Human Rights Commission. And, um, and I looked into some other legal entities that, uh, that might be of assistance. And so um, this is really a very, very brief overview of the two types of groups that might exist. And also um, uh, it has not been fully vetted uh, with uh, town council, although I did have a brief uh, conversation with Sean Mangano about the idea and um, he thought it was unique and something that might actually uh, be a good idea for the type of work that we're doing. So uh, you all are probably familiar with the friends group that's associated with Jones Library and oftentimes um, municipal departments might have a friends group to help support their work and fundraising and, and other uh, efforts. So the first sort of possibility is to create a friends group. So a friends group is independent. It is a 501c charity. Uh, the leadership is independent and it's self-directed. Um, the authority exists under both federal and state law. Uh, the pros of this friends group is that it's very easy to establish. The con is that it's independent from the town. So it really relies on a very good relationship between the town department or town council or town managers and the, the nature of the group. And um, so, and one might envision most of the time, those uh, relationships are probably very positive and there's no, um, you know, adversity or adverse feelings, but um, on occasion there might be. And certainly as an independent group, they can uh, do what they want. The major con that I see is that it's independent from the town and it might require special legislation to award the funds that the town has awarded to an independent organization because it's outside of the municipal government uh, structure. So that's one possibility. Uh, the other possibility is the creation of a trust, very similar to if you think about the affordable housing trust that's created. Um, the affordable housing trust was created by state legislature, which allows municipalities to have this trust structure. Um, uh, it has charitable status, in which meaning that it, people can make do donations to it and they can write those donations off as a charity. Um, it's able to receive grants from both state and federal government, from charities and foundations. The leadership is connected to the uh, to the municipality. So, under the Affordable Housing Trust, if we if that was the model that was being used, trustees are appoint, appointed by the town manager. There's also one council member who's a member of the Affordable Housing Trust. So, there's a direct connection between the trust and the town. Um, for authority, this might require special legislation because there's there does not exist under a current state legislature a mechanism for creation of a trust outside of the affordable housing trust. But I think 
the structure is there and I think there would be a lot of support at the state level for creating this type of entity because um, Amherst is not the only municipality that has DEI efforts or that's seeking to do reparations. And so creating a structure that allows for a connection between a municipality and, um, and a trust organization, I think is one that would be found favorable by this legislature. So uh, the pros that there's an existing model for using uh, utilizing municipal funds for a very specific purpose, i.e. the affordable uh, uh, housing trust, the connection to the town is also a pro. A pro. I think there would be um, ease in designating funds for the specific trust if it were to exist. There are some municipalities that automatically give a percentage of their budget to their affordable housing trust. Others have um, actually taken out bonds to fund their um, affordable housing trust. So there's a real ease in setting aside those municipal funds for this uh, type of entity. And the con is that it may be more difficult to establish initially, like, uh, you know, having KP Law look at it, having um, one of the members of our of the house bring it forward might um, might take a little bit more time to establish so and again that's just a very quick overview um, and one just some of the preliminary research that i've done about those about the two different types of entities that would be available thank you so much pamela and that um slide is very helpful. If you would send that to the group, that would be fantastic. Um, I see we're welcoming Dr. Shabazz here and I'll wait. It looks like he, his audio might be connecting. Hello, hello everyone. Hi, Dr. Shabazz. Um, glad that you can make it and yep, sorry, I'm um, late. don't worry about it. I will get you up to, to speed um, at some point today. We did have some discussion um, that was relevant to our fund and uh, Irv and I presented a couple options, but I, I'll, I'll review all of that with you um, offline. Okay, all right. And so Pamela, that just to kind of um, give context to uh, the information that you were just providing, that is in our report, we have a recommendation about setting up some sort of mechanism that allows for private donations to be received. Um, and so that's um, what Pamela was there reporting on. And I think uh, there's some additional information that you sent to me, Pamela, that I was just looking for that we could also forward to the group. And um, I think it was that initial email that you sent me. So if you would send that and the, sli and the slide, that would be excellent. And then we can revisit it at our next meeting. Sure, I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. And if there are any thoughts on it right now, floor is open for that. Yes, I mean, both of those are uh, desirable kinds of structures. Uh, both of them, it seems, uh, uh, would require uh, or may require uh, special legislation. Is that correct, Pamela, include uh, the trust and the friends group? So the friends group does not require special legislation. So it, it would operate uh, identical to like the friends group for the Jones Library. So that is a group of individuals. So it could be you all as in your role as private citizens or another group of private citizens forming a 501c3 to support the work of the African Heritage Reparations uh, Assembly. And that is an independent group. It's not uh, legally connected to the municipality. And really what um, is important for that group is alignment of mission and relationship. So it's an independent group. They're receiving money. Um, they can choose to spend the money in a way that they want. You all might agree on how money should be spent, but you may disagree. And I think the con, uh, the, um, the con or the or the concern for for that 501c3 is that um, you may require 
uh, a spe sort of special legislation or, or some sort of permission in order to transfer municipal funds to it because it would be independent. So I'm sorry that the answer to uh, your question is yes. Um, I think that that would require um, uh, you know, some additional legal analysis. The, uh, the trust also re probably require special legislation, not simply because there's no current mechanism in place that would allow for the creation of a trust for these specific purposes. But the model already exists if you look at the affordable housing trust. So there is a model already in place at the, st at the state level, but it has a different um, purpose. Interesting. It's, it's sort of like, uh, I'm trying to think of what would be the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, and I guess uh, when I look at it or think about it, the uh, friends group uh, it will still have to go through, it seems like would have, still have to go through some uh, municipal process. Uh, and the, uh, the downside is that is I'm assuming that um, either there is no precedent for that or if there is a precedent for it, then it would put it on equal footing with the, with the trust because right. the trust has uh, already uh, a, a legal a precedent. Right. So I, th I think that's correct. So the I, I don't um, and I, I've only done a little bit of research. So I, you know, I'm not the authoritative uh, on this, but it's my understanding that generally money has flown from a friends group to a municipal department. If you were to seek a friends group and wanted that group to hold the two million dollars, it would be flowing in the opposite direction. And that I think would, would, it would raise the legal concern. You could create the friends group and the town council could still hold the money in a separate fund and they would be distinct. And having a friends group is certainly the past of least resistant because that can be done in a relatively short time. It's just not connected to the municipality. It's a it's an independent 501c3 like the Jones friend, uh, Library Friends Group. What one what, what question I have is in, in terms of the Jones Friends Group, uh, friends group uh, municipal money flows to the uh, Friends Group on some kind of pres prescribed or prescribed uh, formula or acts or something that allows that to happen. And uh, would that be available to this particular Friends Group? So I don't, I, I mean, I had a, a, a conversation with Sharon Sherry and I reviewed the, uh, the documents, the 501c3 IRS documents for the friends group. There may be a mechanism that allows for town funds to flow to the to the friends group, but I'm I'm not aware of it, and I don't have a lot of information about it. Well, doesn't the friends group receive money from the town? So uh, Jennifer has her hands raised, so she she might be able to to answer that question. So using the Friends of the Senior Center, I'm not quite sure what their actual group is, the Friends of um, Council on Aging, they, or the Council on Aging. So the town covers the administrative costs of the Senior Center, and then the Friends group does everything else, right? So the town pays the individuals, um, what do you call it, the, the town pays their annual, uh, you know, the budget salaries for their and operations and salaries and the and the budget for operations. But the friends, like when they want new furniture, that's what the friends group does. When they want to go, they want to have a big event. That's the friends group. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily know that the town is giving the friends group any money. I think that they're held separately. Yeah, I guess I'm talking about the friends of the Jones Library. I would have. Think that it works very similar, right? That would be my uh, my guess as well. I I don't know of a mechanism for the town to funnel money to an independent five hundred one c three. And I, you know, again, I've only done a little bit of research. There there may be a, a methodology for that to happen, but generally speaking, money from a friends group is flowing into a town department and not um, the reverse. Yeah. 
Right, right, right. Dr. Rhodes, I can get you an answer to that question, though. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that and just see, because I, I want to clarify for you. You're ringing a bell for me too. Um, what you're saying, and there is some, some relationship between the budget, our budget, and the budget of the library. But I'm not sure that it is exactly what it, what you might have in mind right now. Right. I, I, I guess when I think about it, yeah, the friends group supplements. The, uh, the budget of the uh, the Jones Library. Uh, and uh, then the town puts money into the Jones Library. It, you, and, uh, so that, in terms of what you're saying, Pamela, it flows from the friends group to the library and, and not vice versa. Right, correct. Yeah. And we also have to really, I think, in this case, um, and it's maybe very specific to reparations, we really have to consider autonomy um, as like a primary factor here, I think. Um, so I would um, I would encourage us to think through what it would look like. I mean, in some sense, we have a municipal fund that's already sort of being controlled um, by the governing body. So it might be that having a more autonomous group that can receive charitable donations is uh, a way to balance that and, and be able to have both. Mm -hmm. um, I also wonder if the friends, uh, in terms of spending the money, um, it, Pamela, maybe we need to look more, a little more into that. Like how can a friends group spend the money differently than a trust can spend the money and what sort of bureaucracy is involved? Um, so the, so the friends group is independent and they can do whatever they want with the money because they're not bound by the procurement and other finance laws that a municipal uh, entity would be. However, um, uh, I think there are some similarities with the affordable housing trust. That money is separate and apart. It is not part of the town's budget. Um, and so it is held in trust. It's, uh, so there's a lot of autonomy and independence there um, um, if that was the mechanism that you wanted to choose. From, from, from my you know, point of view, at looking at it legally, the fact that there is a connection, a legal connection between uh, a trust and the and the town, I think, would be very important. Um, there, the trust does uh, operate with some autonomy, although the members of the board are uh, appointed, and there is a member of the town council would be a member of of the trust or you know one of the trustees but there is some aut autonomy there but um, i can certainly try to do a little bit more research and i will uh, follow up and send the slide and the original email that i sent to you to the members of the assembly thank you very much pamela and you just when as you were talking i was thinking about um a recent uh I think we're going for special legislation on it. I think it was a counselor, Devlin Gothier, who brought it forward, um, where there's some sort of fee for real estate transfers. And a part of that will go to the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, and I, so if that's an advantage, you know, to having it where the municipality is able to actually find creative ways to allocate money, um, then that is a real benefit in my mind too. So yeah, it's a lot to weigh. Um, and, 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 and it's possible that um, a 501c3 group, I mean, we have the Black Assembly of Amherst, Massachusetts, for example, um, they may, as in Evanston, decide um, to organize to create their own uh, entity as well. And so I don't think that it's necessarily one or the other, or that if one happens, the other can't. I think it's just about clarity in terms of the structure. Um, so, okay. Any other um comments i did want to give uh dr shabazz we did we did go through or we opened the floor to feedback on the report 
Um, and right now, their members are still reviewing the draft that was circulated and will be providing feedback via email or at our meeting next week. But I wanted to give you the opportunity as well, since you weren't here, if you'd like to provide any feedback on the report um, to do so now. Thank you. I won't take up any uh, time out of turn. Um, I will uh, send that along um, on uh, in terms of before our next meeting. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, so, all right, we've gotten through uh, the the fund piece. Uh, we we've gotten through um, this piece on the five hundred one c three. Um, so, the other two pieces that I wanted to touch on today are folks. How how are we in for timing today? Is is three fifteen possible for folks to stay? A thumbs up would be good. Okay, um, Ms. Bridges, does three fifteen work for you? I can do that. Okay, and Dr. Shabazz, is that? Yes, that's fine. Oh, perfect. And Pamela or Jennifer, if you need to leave, you can hand it over, and I'll I'll make sure. Um, well, I don't even have to do anything to stop the recording. Mm -hmm. So okay. Um, the piece that I wanted to cover about cash payments, um, and some of you may have seen, I did not know that Scott was going to write the piece that was, I guess, on the front page of the newspaper today. <laughs> um, and he's sort of setting up, um, for our recommendations to come out. So there was a piece in the Hampshire Gazette. Um, I, I haven't spoken to him, so he must have picked up information in our meetings or um, through some other reporting and or um, maybe Dr. Rhodes, did he speak with you at an event over the weekend? It sounded like maybe you had spoken to him. It doesn't matter. I just. Uh, I definitely didn't. I was surprised that he quoted me in there. Yeah. So I, my assumption is that Scott, <laughs> Scott, uh, uh, when he does a story he will go back over all of the public minutes. Yeah. And and he will do a story based upon that. I think you're right. Usually he emails and I, I can give him some clarity, but I think he probably wanted to get something out there knowing that the report is, was coming so soon. So um, that's not a problem, but um, what, he ended that piece um, uh, uh, with cash payments <laughs> as a question. And so I, what I wanted to really ask the committee is, do we want to make any sort of recommendation or provide any discussion? Um, it was my understanding at our meeting last week that we wanted to uh, at least discuss in the report the um, benefit of cash payments, um, the challenges to being able to direct cash payments in a, in a municipality, and what some possible solutions might be, which you saw in the draft report um, in terms of seeking special legislation. But uh, we'll just take you back one more time to our first listening session at the Hitchcock Center when Councilor Walker spoke uh, about there being an emergency fund that could be needed at times and in, 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 in times where a direct payment might benefit an individual person. Um, and I can think of other instances where it might make sense, um, but I wanted to see what is our position in our, you know, in our report on cash payments. I, I know for me, I, I oppose cash payments. Okay. Mainly because of the legal hurdles. That's on the one. On, on the other hand, uh, I had identified uh, people who I, at least one person that I thought really uh, we should um, endeavor to have a cash payment go to. Now, having said that, it means that uh, if we do say, yes, we want to do a cash payment, uh, then we certainly will have to go through a legislative process. Yes, and we've outlined that in our report. Um, so at least we we have that much there. That, um, But I, I guess, you know, this is a question that I think generates a lot of charge. And so I think, uh, for me, I think it's important that we're very clear on our position in the report. Dr. Shabazz. 
So um, today, uh, because of the front page article, um, the uh, talk of the talk the talk with uh, Bill and Buzz, I was asked to focus on uh, the segment on reparations. And as we ended the discussion, um, this direct compensation uh, issue uh, arise, and, and we even talked a little further after we even ended the show. You know, the um, I, I get the KP Law report. I challenged it uh, when we had uh, the attorney from KP Law in terms of the way in which um, law and legal precedents around race-based affirmative action are what they focused so much of their legal review upon. And uh, our attorney here in the Zoom may wish to explain or challenge or, or, what, or debate me on it. But I really think, as I said at that time when the attorney from KP Law was here, that that's really wrongheaded. Affir uh, affirmative action was an attempt for a race-based policy blanketly trying to help um, a group on the basis of race. It did not attempt to address it as helping a specific group who had been victims, who had been harmed by specific policies, okay? Which is what reparations aims to do. No one suggested that uh, uh, and, and, and challenged illegally in 1980 when Ronald Reagan signed the Reparations Act for uh, th those who were victims of internment. They just happened to be Japanese Americans, okay? But it wasn't a program blanketly for all Japanese Americans or anybody with Japanese descent. It was specifically for those of Japanese descent who had been through, whose family had gone through the internment process, okay? And put in concentration camps in this country, the United States of America. So it's the same thing with reparations for slavery, okay? And anti-racist uh, and, and the and, uh, anti-black racism policies that continued even after shadow slavery was ended. It's the same thing. If we look at it as that way, this is not just helping all black people generically because they're black and downtrodden. It's about specifically repairing the harm to those people of African descent who underwent enslavement, whose ancestors underwent enslavement and who generations uh, continue to be uh, racially oppressed with the sanction of the United States government. So when we, when we and uh, understand the matter in that respect, then you don't have to go and look at legal precedents around race-based affirmative action because it's non sequitur, it doesn't even relate. So I still feel that we should be looking at direct compensation. Dr. Rhodes, even though he starts himself out as saying he's opponent of it, he then comes back to say, but I could see in specific instances. Well, the whole thing is in specific instances. In specific instance, of people harmed in Amherst. Yes, we want to have a way to compensate, a way to, to address it if there is evidence of a, of a problem of structural racism historically or today, tomorrow, any day that it may happen, that it represents the vestiges of everything we're fighting, of everything we're seeking to end, then yes, why not have the ability to, to contribute and to understand it's on that basis. It's not on the basis of, you know, because of, because of the person's skin color, you're doing something for them. So, you, but you're doing something for a specific group who've undergone a specific harm or, uh, and still faced with aspects of that specific harm. So I do think we need that capacity. Um, and only thing I think we can do is pass on to those doing the work after our report to really uh, look at the, the, uh, the channels through the state government, through uh, uh, special legislation, all, whatever else it, it takes to, uh, we, we should do our best to kind of outline and bracket what we have learned through the process, but definitely to pass on to the successor group, the recommendation that that power, that capacity 
to directly compensate an individual or uh, 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 any member of the targeted group that we're trying to address because of the history, because of present day discriminations, then, then yes, we want to pass that possibility on and, uh, uh, and outline the channels for, for however we need to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Shabazz. I'm going to go to Jennifer in a second, but I just want to expand on that a bit to remind us that we we have the special legislation that's already been drafted by KP Law. The town council has already approved um, us uh, moving forward in, in at least, you know, I'm not sure if it was a vote, but they've already said, uh, you know, we've seen this legal opinion, we see this special legislation that KP Law drafted, and we are in support of giving this over to our state representative to take through the legislative process. So if we come to a, a, a decision on that, I, I think that we don't even need to hand it over to the successor body. I think we need to recommend that the town uh, move forward to pursue that special legislation that we've already done all of that work. Um, so, and I can send that all to you um, just to remind us because we did that work actually toward the beginning of our term. Um, so I'll I'll send that. that and out. shouldn't that be in the appendix um, uh, yeah. just as part of our work? Okay. Exactly. Absolutely, Dr. Shabazz. Yes. Um, so, okay, I saw Jennifer's hand go up and then Dr. Rhodes. Um, I just wanted to check in because if you had a, either a friends or a trust, you wouldn't have to check in with anyone, correct? Because they can spend money in a complete different way. Yeah, I think that, you know, I and I I just saw Pamela's email come through and I wanted to clarify. Um, I don't think we are suggesting that the $2 million um, that the town has committed to be moved to a, a group that would not be connected with the town. Um, I, I think what we were talking about is that there is the $2 million that is connected to the town. And that's the recommendations that we're making right now in terms of use of funds and funding priorities. And then there's the possible uh, creation of a group that could accept private donations. And then that, yes, in, in that case, Jennifer, um, that money could be spent however that group sees fit, particularly in the case of the friends. Does that make Jennifer? Sorry, go ahead, please. Sorry. No, I said I understand. Okay. All right. Um, Dr. Rhodes. I, I'm not opposed to uh, what we had already agreed to, and which is already in motion. At least I thought it was already in motion. And that is that uh, the town was going to charge uh, KP Law with taking this forward uh, to the process of special legislation. That's one whole other thing. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I'm in, I'm in favor of that going forward uh, to, see where that, to see where that goes. But philosophically, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just not there when it comes to um, individual uh, possible blanket uh, in, in terms of what, uh, when, even when I define it the way um, Dr. Shabazz has defined it, I, I have uh, uh, some problems with it. Uh, and and because it it it, it you know, in practicality, but that's not for me to decide. All I'm saying is, for me, uh, it, it personally uh, doesn't resonate with me. But I'm not opposed uh, to the group and to the um, AHRA recommending that this go forward. Okay, perfect. So I think we um, unless. Um, Ms. Bridges or Hala, I think we've already had a consensus bait, uh, way earlier on on this. So let me send out those documents again to the group, and then we can certainly revisit it next Monday. Um, but that that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Are there any other um, comments on that before I uh, introduce uh, a recommendation that I would like to uh, the, the assembly to consider. Okay. 
Um, so one other, just before I do that, uh, they're in the, in the draft report, I think it is, just give me one second here. Um, right now it is number 11. Uh, this was added. It's, it says provide ancestry research resources to African heritage, African heritage residents. Um, and so this was something that based on previous discussions, based on uh, many conversations I've had with Dr. Shabazz in, in particular, um, this was a, a placeholder that we put in there and I wanted to um, see if there was any feedback on that. The other recommendation that I'm gonna present now is not in the draft report, but is there any feedback on the recommendation to provide ancestry research resources to African heritage residents? Okay, so I just, I wanna develop this um, a bit more. I'm going to look in, I know um, the Jones Library, I believe received some uh, substantial grant funding um, to do some work that might be similarly aligned to this and or where there would be a hub um, to allow for work like this to occur. Um, so I'll I'll try to develop a, a little bit more there between now and our next meeting so that we can look at that together. All right, so the recommendation that I would like for the assembly to cons consider is um, related to the discontinuance of low level and pretextual uh, uh, searches, um, so tra traffic stops basically, um, and consent searches. Um, and let me just explain a little bit about where I'm coming from here. So um, the Community Safety Working Group in their Part B of their report, uh, they did a very thorough analysis of the police uh, protocols. And they worked with LEAP, um, if you haven't seen that LEAP report, I, I strongly suggest taking a look at it. Um, so if you are able to pull up either now or at some point the CSWG report, um, again, this is part B of the report, and it starts on page, about page 23, where they start to talk about consent searches um, and then they move into um, uh, low level traffic stops. And um, it's, it's a very, very interesting piece of the report and they recommended discontinuing both. And so without uh, adding too much specific, I, in my council role received information from a constituent who was stopped by the police last week um, and really a uh, black man who had a, a really unfortunate uh, experience. And it just, it made me think about uh, what we've asked in our survey. It, it made me think about what um, the CSWG and the CSSJC has been talking about for quite some time. And, um, I'm curious whether this group feels like uh, recommending such a, a policy or a change in policy would be considered um, an act of reparations in the town. And so I'm going to open it up and I also will send the information that came directly from the LEAP report and the CSWG report, which includes a lot more um, data that might help you to consider um, your position on this. What what would be what would the recommendation be uh, as it specifically we re relate to reparations? Uh, would it be uh, a something that's a reparative or restorative justice uh, kind of uh, of act? Or, or, or proposal from the AHRA and uh, how would that, would that be a blanket to all people of color, black people only, uh, you know, or, or would it be blanket to everyone that uh, searches stop? 
That's a great question. And Dr. Rhodes, I'm still, I, I've really, this has sort of been a process for me coming to this. Um, but I, I think that the recommendation would be essentially to build off the recommendation that the CSWG has already put into their final report based on their collaboration with LEAP. Um, and of course, so um, let me be, be more, even more specific to say that there is um, there are other municipalities who have adopted um, similar um, types of ordinances. So in this case, for example, um, the, let me um, look at what this is called here. So in ordinance, um, it, it's, it's uh, Dr. Shabazz, I sent it to you, I believe. I'm just pulling it up here. A uh, driving equality ordinance is what it's called. Um, and this was in, a, 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 in Michigan. Um, this was adopted and um, essentially, it it you, it's not based on any one race. It just means that secondary traffic stops are not permitted. So if somebody has a broken tail light, or if their air freshener is dangling too low in their vehicle, or um, any any reason that wouldn't be putting uh, folks um, in in harm's way necessarily all of those sort of reasons that people get pulled over where racial profiling does exist um, that would they those stops would be discontinued so we would be recommending that the um, that the police department adopt such a policy dr Shabazz yes I um, concur and I think uh, also as uh, relative to what Dr. Rose is raising, we, we do want to have, you know, maybe work out more explicit language, specific language. I wouldn't try to do it right now, right here on the fly, but I think we, we should work out the, um, the precise language that we're, we're asking to, we're suggesting to introduce into our report as a recommendation area, and then we can have that to, to look at. Um, the, I think really the language of it would go in kind of two directions. And um, I think one is it ought to be predicated upon some of the discussion we've had um, the, and, and, and things we've looked at building up all along the way um, in this whole area of, of criminal uh, um, injustice, crime and punishment. That is one of the five harm areas. And, um, you know, our first listening session, we kind of opened up on that. And uh, we were at that time coming, you know, just months off of the July 5th incident. So, you know, and, and I'm reminding, I'm reminded of a report um, that uh, somehow Alyssa Brewer's name is in connection with it, but many years back that raised the question of racial profiling occurring in, in Amherst and in, in uh, police stops. So uh, by, a, by a previous commission some years back that had looked into it. So, um, but, it, but there was no kind of follow on. There was no sort of follow up in terms of any sort of ordinances or anything, but, but they came to certain, uh, but, but alarms were, came up even back then in that report, if, I, if memory serves me. So I think it's a matter of, um, you know, looking both at it in, in the context of this general harm area um, of the question of racial profiling that you just raised. Uh, um, and also from a standpoint of, you know, what goes towards the greater good. Every, um, some of our recommendations can be things that will be, that will benefit other groups besides, you know, the group we're looking at uh, that have been, that has been harmed. For example, when we've talked about Youth Empowerment Center, or we've talked about um, things and you know uh, 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 other forms of things, we're talking about recommending our support for uh, with with businesses and so on. That um, it it may well go beyond just black to encompass Indigenous people of color and 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 uh, economically disadvantaged of of any group, but. Um, it's, uh, uh, but our specific reason for doing it, I think does emerge out of the reparative justice framework that we're, 
that we're really trying to advance. And I think we can reference uh, some of those prior reports uh, regarding racial profiling, some of the national data that you mentioned there toward backing this specific recommendation being related to our work too. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Shabazz. Um, Dr. Rhodes. I can see us uh, saying in our, our report that we support the recommendation of the uh, whatever, CS, the CSWG group. We can, we can support that recommendation. I don't think we have to go any further than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think I, I don't disagree with you other than to say that was written into a report two years ago and nothing. And, and when I reviewed, uh, you know, uh, the the police policies today, um, they and I know they will be going through some some review um, based on council discussion and, and council votes that 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 directed for those things to happen, but I was quite surprised at how uh, some of the language was really very outdated and um, was concerning to me in the context of hearing about this constituent of mine and the experience they had. Um, and I think that we, th that situation made me realize that we have been sheltered in a lot of ways from a major, uh, you know, sort of incident occurring here in Amherst. And I think that it's possible that an incident, not because we don't have a, a, a police department that is with people who are caring and good people and good police officers, but just because of sort of the um, the the way that the policies are written now, um, and and so I have a lot of concern, and I want to see this um, particular um, particular recommendation of um, discontinuing these secondary traffic stops be taken off of the page and and into reality, and so. Um, Dr. Shabazz, please. Yes, yeah, so I, I really think too, we, we should work on language that um, does really highlight the, the broad problem of, um, of, of, of racial profiling and, 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 and ask for um, changes to be made in terms of police practices, in terms of police training, in terms of, I mean, a whole gamut. Because, you know, so on the one hand, there are stops based around, as you say, non-life threatening to anybody kind of situations like a broken tail light, like in Northampton, okay? And then on the other hand, there could be, you know, just there's a report of um, a possible crime that involved someone who's been described as black, and then you just dragnet everybody black that's on the road, regardless of you know any other any other evidence or anything else that could link that particular person. You know, well they were seen leaving in a black car, but this person is in a white car, uh, or they were seen wearing red, but this person is wearing gray. You know, I mean. You would need to, you, we need to recommend some deeper thinking around this in our police department than where we are right now. And, and you all on the council have worked on this. I know you all pushed for this idea of an anti-racist culture. Um, and, I, and I just think we ought to think about, because this is one of our major five harm areas, really strong language in our report that says, yes, we hear this, we see this, it, we recognize this as part of the scope of, of reparative justice work. And we really want to see, we really recommend serious actions be taken in terms of ordinances or any kinds of you know, commission on police practice or anything that can be done. Because all I tend to see is 
our town comes and whitewashes after things happen, you know, have whitewash reports on that, that says our police is the greatest thing since, you know, sliced bread. And, and you know what, that's, that's all good until we get a George Floyd situation here. That's gonna all be wonderful to say for our department until something bad happens. And that bad is what we really wanna prevent. And so anybody, any department can be questioned and can be pushed to, to, to you know, look harder at its practices. We're not trying to tie the hands of the police. We're not trying to prevent the police from keeping us safe and, and catching bad guys, catching criminals. We're not trying to do that at all. But we are saying, given the preponderance of things we see around the country, given things we see even in our own streets here in Amherst or across the bridge in Northampton, that we need to pay attention and really check ourselves uh, before we wreck ourselves. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz Hala. Yes, I was going to echo a little bit or support what Dr. Shabazz is saying. And, and then what you brought up in terms of we need, I think it needs to be explicitly stated and requested again to amplify it because that was two years ago. And I can tell person, personally, I've been stopped a few times without a reason giving. So not even a secondary reason in Amherst and just made to show my documents. And Timid Hala, who doesn't know her rights, just does it and doesn't even ask why am I being stopped. But, um, you know, so it, it not not attacking any one organization, but we do need to do better with our institutions and our systems. And I'm grateful that we could request that as a reparative act. And yes, when we uplift those who are most marginalized or targeted, everyone benefits. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hala. Dr. Rhodes? Yeah, I, I, again, I think that our remarks would be more effective if we support that which has already been brought forward. That, that all we're doing is adding our voice to it. Uh, and they are already in a position to carry that forward. We will not be. All right. So I, I, re I really I really want us to focus on that and focus on that group that's already there and bring, so that they can then continue to bring pressure where pressure needs to be brought. You know, I, I you know, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, opposed to what people say. My People have all kinds of different experiences in this town. Black people do. Uh, I, I, I know that I have been personally stopped a number of times, uh, but, um, but, but stopped in, 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 in questioning in courteous ways. Uh, and, and, and yes, uh, I, was, I was stopped because I was wrong, uh, but uh, nothing occurred. Uh, in fact, one police officer has, uh, on this particular street, because I don't pay attention, has stopped me five different times. And uh, now the person knows my name and says, uh, hey, Irv, why are you still speeding down this road? And I said, well, I was uh, lost in thought. But anyway, uh, it doesn't, so I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I just, no, I just, my, I, I guess I don't, I, I, I want to focus on that which is already on the table. I want to be able to support that group that is already there working on it. And I want that to be the message that we send out that is carried forward by a group that's already working on it. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Yes, so we'll work on some language and, and also just keeping in mind that what we put out there in terms of how we see uh, you know, what we see is reparative in a community is being seen by communities all over the country as soon as that report hits. And so we're not only speaking to our own community, but we're speaking across the country. Um, and so I think uh, it's absolutely appropriate to support uh, the recommendation that has already been made by a group who was tasked with community safety. Um, and it's also appropriate for us to be bold in our language um, to really amplify that. And so let's find a place, we'll get some language and, and we'll prepare it for the group to, to look at. 
Um, and I did see Ms. Bridges that your hand went up and I, and I think it did. And then I just wanted to check in with you, Ms. Bridges. No, I was um, listening to, to Irv and really wanted to agree with him just to let him know. Okay. So like agreeing with um, sort of putting the recommendation forward in support of um, the recommendation that the, the CSW. Well, if some, I'm, I'm saying if someone's, you know, if someone's um, got that in there um, and I'm not sure if the, if it's already been put out there um, that they, they may need more training. They need more racial training, the police, um, and it's already been put out there um, just to support the people who are putting it, you know, letting them know that this is what they want. Okay, yeah. All right, let's, yeah, I think I, I personally wasn't going on the sort of angle of training because I think that the DEI department and the council actions have sort of been working on that piece of things. Um, but we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll put something together. I'm just looking at the time here. It's 318. Um, and we do need to call one more period of public comment. Are folks able to stay for a few more minutes for that to occur? Okay, um, so I'm going to go ahead and call the second period of public comment. Um, and if you would like to make public comment, please go ahead and use the raise hand function. I Everybody's here that was here when I read the statement last time, so I'm not going to read it again. Pamela and Jennifer, are you seeing any hands raised? I just want to double check. I do not. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, okay. So, oh, hold on. <laughs> we have one. <laughs> okay. Excellent. We'll um, just move you in. Just, just one moment. Okay. Welcome. Will they introduce themselves? Yes. I... Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. This is Lauren Mills. Uh, thank you for holding the public comment. I um, was pressing the wrong button, so my hand went out late. Um, I wanted to just make a few comments. I know that um, the way that the money might be used kind of goes, not used, but where the money will be, um, whether you were talking about in a trust or in a, a separate um, nonprofit, you know, organization that's set up kind of goes over people's heads right now because we are, I myself am still wondering what is the what, what, what will the money be used for? Because we know that um, in communities that are in need, there's a lot of things that um, resources could go towards. And um, I'm just a little confused. I, I don't want to use the word confused, but the discussion of federal responsibility toward reparation and you as a local um, committee dealing with specific town, it, it seems like those arguments or opinions are are being mixed together. So I would really like to know what is, as far as you, you, your data and your facts and your surveys, what what did that show is the need for the town of Amherst and for those communities who would be um, targeted or who are being said are are the the group that would receive um, resources from reparations and also um, just there's a, a saying uh, I don't know if it was Nelson Mandela or my interview but a, a famous person um, said that it's better to like be 
it's better to strengthen a younger generation than to pre, uh, to repair a broken um, older generation. So I I just feel like we again need to concentrate on education because that stimulates how we will be able to move forward um, in our families, in our community, and also um, better ourselves. And also, um, I just also wanted to say that um, I was having a conversation with my children today about can racism, can it, can it, function without an institution. And I, I think racism needs an institution or a system to function. And so likewise, there has to be some kind of institution, a cultural institution or edu educational in institution to support our youth and to, to support our communities of color. And I would just hope that um, your report has some data and and reflect what, even though it was a small amount of um, people who identified as black, to really think about what data and what um, the survey reflected as the need. And, you know, I would say that we need a, a youth and a cultural center. So just thank you. And thank you for allowing me to comment. Thank you, Lauren, um, for all of your comments. Um, and I just wanted to quickly review in response to, to Lauren's, in, in response, but just, just to sort of review for us that um, right now for funding priorities, what we have been able to glean from the survey and from the listening sessions um, we have our, our number one funding priority is youth programming, um, youth empowerment and, and education. Um, number two, we have at, uh, home, home ownership of affordable housing. Um, and number three, we have business grants and entrepreneurial training. Um, we also talked today, I think you were here for that conversation um, about community safety. So just so you know where we're at um, at this time in, in terms of the funding priorities and what we've pulled from the various data that we've collected. All right, so if there are any other uh, public comments, please go ahead and raise your hand. And I'm not seeing any other hands, so I'm just going to look to the committee to see if there are any other uh, final remarks. And also, I'm going to, I'm going to, Dr. Shabazz will close us out. I'm going to just uh, say that you'll have a lot of information coming to you this week that we've talked about today, and also uh, would ask that you um, provide feedback on the draft report so that we can continue to move that forward. And we'll be meeting again next week at uh, 2 p.m. at our normal time. So, Dr. Shabazz, did you want to? Um, yes, maybe maybe something was said on this in the port part uh, before I got here, but let me just raise how um, what a wonderful event this past weekend with the grand opening of Carefree Cakery. You know, this is the kind of repair, uh, the kind of building of a community that shows up for, for, for each other and, and the way that the community showed up for Alicia Bryant and her family and her coworkers uh, at the Mill District in North Amherst. And I hope that, you know, it made me really think that if the 40 acres and a mule, if the reparations that was due came about back there in the 1860s, that we could have more like that. We could have more of our share of that kind of, of, of input into our community, those kinds of businesses. You know, it's one thing to say, you know, about the execution of a good plan and a good business skills and entrepreneur, and that's all wonderful, but it's also about the heart. And it's mm -hmm. about the heart of the community to come out and to see someone 
who is bringing that kind of excellence and say, we got you, we support you, you know, and to keep coming and to keep, you know, and to, and to embrace that, uh, 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 that, that business and the people making that business um, really embrace them as uh, to the heart of this community. So I hope we, you know, through this work that we'll recommend and the work that follows from the council and from the community that we will have more wins, more victories like that in the near future, bringing us together as a, as a vibrant uh, community of, of human beings. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Dr. Rhodes? Yeah, that was a great event. And it represented the best of Amherst. Hmm. Uh, you know, from all walks of life, all races, ethnic groups, etc., came together uh, to support this business. It was, it, it, but the thing that I said in my Facebook page, page was that this person who I had sat down with, Alicia, was that She's a fine business person, well-trained. She had an incredible marketing plan. She, uh, she has all her numbers. She, she is solid across the board. And that in and of itself, no matter what race you are, usually not 100% makes for a successful business. Absolutely. She was, she's an amazing young lady. Awesome. Well, I was so sad to miss that event. And um, I'm so glad that we had the chance to talk about it today. And um, it, it is when you think about what was sort of the formula for all of that to come together in such a powerful and, and fantastic way. And I, I caught a little bit of the video of the ribbon cutting and um, Alicia just breaking into tears in, in a moment of, I think, what seemed like um, just joy and and um, it was really, really touching. Um, so, okay, wonderful. I know there was also the community, I was going to um, also to, to say that there was a community safety day, I think that occurred um, on, that, on that day as well on Saturday. Um, and I think that was at the Mill River. So there was a lot going on this weekend, um, a lot of good, good stuff. Fundraising for cancer, fighting cancer. Yeah, <laughs> I was at one of those. You know and Hala, are you, are you eating some cake? I look like Hala's eating some cake. <laughs> oh, and Hala's running for town council. So let's just, we need to like give a big, oh, and Irv, are you <laughs> running for school committee, right? Or you have Yes, I think it's out there. One last thing, I, I keep, it just keeps always uh, running I forget to mention it. We have been meeting for two plus years and we have never met in person. Mm. We need to do that before we end formally. I have a plan. <laughs> I, I, I was hoping that you had a plan, but I needed I to Jennifer, sure. Jennifer doesn't want it though. I, Jennifer doesn't yeah. want that. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to make sure of course. it was said. So, all right. So, therefore, if you have a plan, I'm going to go with that. Yeah, I have a plan. <laughs> Some of us did actually meet for our retreat um, at Town Hall, but we didn't, we weren't all there. So, we certainly need to all be together. And, and I, I do have a plan. <laughs> so, that's, uh, thank you for raising that, Dr. Rhodes. And I'm, I I'm actually. Leave. I'm yes, late. I know we're we're past time here, and and thank you to everybody, and um, we'll see you all next week. I was just teasing Bridget, you, here's Rocky for you. Have a good night. I, 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 I just was messing with you, Rocky's Jennifer. Rocky's included I know. in your plan. <laughs> He's included. <laughs> yes. Good. Hi, right. Rocky. <laughs> Say hi. Can you see? Let's see. Oh, he's see him. blurred. I guess. Let me see if I can um, unblur, and you can say. <laughs> Say hi, buddy. There he is. <laughs>